The Unshackled Waves, episode 251. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome to another Waves episode. Probably the greatest horror that plagues our society is the practice of abortion. Healthy babies are killed at abortion clinics in our major cities every day. It can be a very demoralizing time being a pro-life advocate in Australia. Not only is there a trend to legal abortion up until birth, but now to erect exclusion zones around abortion clinics, meaning that pro-life advocates cannot even offer information to women entering the clinic thinking about an abortion. One pro-life advocate who has found herself on the wrong side of these exclusion zone laws and took her case all the way to the High Court is Kathy Club. She has an incredible life story. She's a mother of 13 children who she homeschools. She's a devout Catholic. Uh, She runs two online blogs, The Freedoms Project and Light Up the Darkness, which chronologues her activism against abortion as well as commentary on religious freedom and other ethical issues. And it's my pleasure to have Kathy as my guest today. Kathy, welcome to the show. Hey, Tim, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Uh, now, you've had uh, quite the, the life's uh, journey. Now, uh, people would think that uh, because you're a devout Catholic with, with 13 children that you uh, were brought up uh, that way, that you must have had a traditional upbringing, but that's not the case. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that I had a traditional upbringing. Um, I was brought up Catholic, but I stopped practicing as a teenager and went uh, in a completely opposite direction and um, to the point where I was taking drugs and binge drinking and found myself pregnant at the age of 20. I I had had some early exposure to the pro-life message, which hadn't really, I didn't think it had sunk in, didn't really think about it until I had to make a decision about keeping my baby or not. Now, uh, 20 uh, with an unplanned pregnancy, there's a lot of voices that tell you, you know, the best thing for for you and bizarrely the child is to to have an abortion. This is what sort of I I see that there's a lot of these voices abort, 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 but you didn't choose that path. I didn't. I I did have some people telling me that was the best thing, um, especially because I'd taken some LSD early on in the pregnancy before I knew I was pregnant. Um, But because when I was very young, a young child, I found some literature about abortion at my parents' house and I saw um, diagrams of an abortion procedure. So they weren't photographs like the abortion victim imagery that we see now. But it was enough to show me what was happening and I knew that abortion was killing a baby. So I never doubted that through my whole life, despite all the other really bad things I did. I knew abortion was wrong and I knew it was killing. And I felt I had to take responsibility. It wasn't, wasn't, it was a human life. It wasn't something I could just discard and pretend wasn't there. I had to really make a decision and, and become a mum. And that's, that's what I did. And so you had the, the baby and now you're a mother of, of 13. So uh, my next question is, can you fill in the, the, the blanks from, from that first venture into to motherhood until today? I always feel bad because I, I have to put in that I'm divorced. So um, I started out um, with my child. I met my husband. We had 12 more children. Um, and at that point I was practicing. Um, I started to practice my faith again. And um, I think part of the reason that I'm so strong in my faith now is because I homeschooled. So I had to go back and relearn what, I, you know, what did it mean to be a Catholic? What did it mean to be a Christian? It's not just enough to call yourself this name. You know, it's got to make an impact on your life in the way that you actually live every day. So that's what I set my heart on doing. But unfortunately, um, after um, just over 20 years of marriage, the marriage fell apart. And... Um, the reason that I always talk about that when I talk about my pro-life story is because that's what got me into activism. It was at this point, this terribly low point in my life when I had all these children to take care of and I, you know, I wasn't employable. All I'd done is homeschool for 20 years. Um, 
I was at, depressed and discouraged and, and God called me into pro-life work. So that's the whole story of it. He actually called me to do this work and he showed me that it doesn't, it doesn't matter what I'm going through. What about these babies? They're being killed. Nothing is worse than that. than not even having the right to draw a breath. So that's what, how I got started. I think it's important that you share that uh, sto uh, story about uh, your your personal life because they, uh, the in the sort of like old uh, days there there was a lot of uh, women got abortions because they they weren't married and they they didn't want the the shame of being a a single mother and uh, the church uh, to to an extent did perpetuate that but I think it's really great to, today that. The, the message is it doesn't matter how a pregnancy occurs, the mother, no matter how a child conceived or how they're going to be brought into the world, they deserve life and the, the mother doesn't deserve judgment but support. Once the baby's here, we have to do all we can to support that mother. The baby needs the mum. The baby needs to know its biological mum and the mum has got a bond with the baby and she needs that baby. So, yeah, it's great if a baby's born into an intact, stable home, that's obviously that's ideal and that's what we want, but we're not, we can't make the call that this, the circumstances of this conception isn't, is going to mean that the baby's going to have a terrible life. Even a rape conceived baby has the right to life. So you have to just take it down to its basic principle. This is a human rights argument about the right to life of the child. Everything else is peripheral to that. Now, you mentioned what convinced you to have your first child was the, the pro-life literature that you saw. And I definitely feel that there, there, there is a effort to sort of hide from the Australian public what an abortion procedure actually is. I, I recently saw the, the movie Unplanned about uh, Abby Johnson's uh, journey out of the, the abortion industry and it shows very graphically at the beginning an abortion procedure and I was already pro-life and I was completely shaken just seeing that and think that how can anyone after like seeing that think that you know this is this is not a child and they use language such as a, a medical procedure it's it's health care to make it look like it's just going to the that a doctor's like getting your uh, appendix out and even women who go for an uh, abortion procedure they, they try to shun them from you know what's actually taking place as much as possible yeah that's the only way that they can get away with it Tim if, if everybody knew what an abortion looks like there would just be no abortions it's so horrific it's just a terrible thing it's amazing to us I think that the staff become desensitized and so that they can watch a procedure and they they can know what's happening but i think there must be a lot of mental reservation going on um they must be really disconnected from what's happening because i saw on plan two and i was really confronted and we didn't you know there was no um you didn't see the body of the child like an aborted child or anything which we we already know is confronting you just saw what was happening in the room and that was enough and um, I, when I had seen it, I texted a friend of mine that I knew was going to go see the movie the next night. And I knew she'd had an abortion and I just warned her. I said, it's really confronting. There's a lot of blood. And um, it turned out that she was okay with it. But yeah, I think that movie's going to have an impact because it does get the message across about what's happening. And um, I think similarly, there is a place for abortion victim imagery as well. I think that we need to use the photographs of the dead babies because for many people that's the only thing that's going to have an impact. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. The, going back to the scene in the movie, it's confronting, but that's what happens. And in in anything that happens in the world, whether it be, you know, like war crimes, like I don't think we should censor like things that are, that are going on, sanitize them to sort of spare people's emotions because we need to know that there's horrible things going on on the world so we can work to uh, prevent it absolutely it's it's like it says in the bible the truth will set you free we have to see this truth before we can really um come to terms with with what it means if we just use the word abortion or termination 
even for pro-lifers, we can become a bit desensitized. We we all need to, from time to time, I think, re-watch videos or re-look at the images just to um, bring it home again so that it doesn't become an abstract thing. It's this, it's death, it's killing, it's murder, it's, it's an atrocity, it's a human rights abuse. And even myself at times, like I sort of feel that I'm being uh, quite sort of forceful and aggressive when I say that, even though it's the truth, it's, I, I guess it shows just where the, the debate is. You can't, in our society at the moment, you can't call it killing murder um, because it's, it's just a, an opinion which is shattered down so, so readily. Yeah, you, you probably see the kind of comments that I see on Twitter, especially. People are still saying, it's not a baby, it's not alive. And the, the most ridiculous claims that we know have been completely debunked through ultrasound technology, for example. I mean, people are in a, they're just in a dream world trying to justify abortion by, by imagining that it's not what it is. But they, they continue until such time as they're ready to face the reality, I guess. Now, as we mentioned before, there's plenty of voices uh, around uh, a woman and in society that tell her to abort. And what pro-life advocates uh, do is provide alternative perspectives, saying that you know you, sh you should reconsider a, a termination, how it'll affect you, you know, in the in the long term, and you know you should also look at the positives about you know bringing a a child into the world and an effective way to do this was uh, what a term sidewalk counselors handing out uh, information outside uh, abortion clinics or as they're also called helpers now abortion advocates they did their best to, to demonize you saying that you know when women are entering the clinic you're calling them murderers and and being uh, really horrible to them but but that's another mistruth isn't it Oh, that's right, Tim. I've never ever seen that kind of activity in my experience. Um, I've heard of it happening, I've never seen it. And I don't doubt that it does happen in some places, but that's the exception. For the most part, we really, really want to help these women. We really, really want the baby saved, but we actually want to help the women. And that's, that's the way that we approach sidewalk counselling. Um, additionally, the way that we used to do it at Croydon, which was my main place of witnessing, um, everybody would be praying except for one person, and that one person would approach the, the women going in, so that it, they never felt um, that they were being ganged up on, they were never overwhelmed, it was easy just to see one person there. Um, despite that, um, most women don't listen, most women walk straight past us, um, and that's okay, we know that. We know that we're there for the ones who are ambivalent and um, we're there to pray as well. And you did but, yeah, save that, uh, plenty of uh, babies and, and women uh, during that time when you were allowed to. Um, it's a bit of a myth actually. I personally haven't saved hundreds. Um, that number's gone around, but the Melbourne helpers over the last couple of decades as a group have saved hundreds of babies. It's really an amazing effort. And there have been um, around 500 saved in Sydney. There have been babies saved in Perth and in Albury and anywhere where the helpers are allowed to pray for any period of time or 40 days for life does the same work. You will find babies saved, definitely. It could, it's really effective. And for, you know, we have to keep in mind, so many of the women who go to the abortion mill do not want to be there. They would gladly keep their babies or they might hesitantly keep their babies if they had some support but so many of them don't know there's support available and what the media does chooses to ignore um, is that we provide so much practical help we're there to pay medical bills find accommodation get jobs help help a woman get out of a, a really unhealthy relationship if that's her problem we're there to help in whatever way she needs and this is another myth put out by the pro-abortion lobby that you don't care about the child once they're born, which, as you've just said, is not true at all. Like, you know that yep. uh, uh, if the child 
if they choose to have the child, then it's going to be tough for them and, you know, need to make sure that, you know, they're going to be, be happy and, and that child is, is going to have a, a good uh, start in life. Absolutely. And I, I, it makes me really angry when I see comments on social media about that we, we should be there for 18 years, you know. Are you promising to do everything for that child, support that child for 18 years? That's absolutely ridiculous. Not because we wouldn't, but because the moms don't want that. What mother wants someone interfering in her life for 18 years, you know, or what mother feels like um, she's is so incompetent that she can't take care of her child for 18 whole years. Women just need a bit of help at the beginning when it's really scary. And then most of them, most of the ones who that we call turnarounds don't even want any practical help. They just needed someone there that day to say, hey, you don't have to go ahead with this. They needed the moral support. So that says a lot as well. People don't have confidence to parent these days. They don't have confidence that um, this is just a hiccup in their life. It's, you know, the, the media, apart from what they say about us and apart from what they say about abortion, they've also completely denigrated motherhood. And motherhood is not something to aspire to anymore. Motherhood is seen as this, um, this thing that you just might have to deal with at some point in your life. Put it off as long as possible, then get it out of the way as quickly as possible if you want children. But you don't really need children because there's all these other things you could be doing. It's just ridiculous. Part of what we need to do is to get back to um, supporting the very idea of motherhood and, and fatherhood as well and families, supporting families the idea of the family as well but it's essentially mothers because they're the ones having the babies yeah that's you make an important point there because i can't stand those mummy blogger websites where they basically treat their children as sort of accessories to sort of show off to their friends to to climb the social hierarchy and you see all these things like oh it's school holidays i've got to keep the kids occupied like they're a real what? burden and that's that's not the way it should be and I, I saw uh, one of my, it was actually a male friend, like say like, uh, I'm so glad it's the school holidays, I get to spend time uh, with my daughter. And I was just so pleased to see that. That's really lovely. That's, that's really lovely to hear. Because I've always homeschooled, I could never understand that. I just, I love being with my kids. I'm with them all the time. I love school holidays because we don't have to do school. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we, we're together and, um, not everyone can homeschool, but certainly everyone can really um, enjoy being with their kids. They're only little for so long. Then they're off. Then they're out in the world and you miss them. Uh, obviously, if a woman has an unplanned pregnancy, then yes, motherhood is is daunting. But I, I've uh, seen in my life like plenty of women who've had unplanned pregnancies. And it's just something that you, you fall into, you, you learn on it because it's, it's natural. And even six months, they're, they're, they're so competent at it. It's like, you don't need those man parenting manuals. Uh, it, it's just something that you learn and you excel at really easily. Yeah, we're made for it. Women are made to take care of children. It's built into our bodies. So it's not something to fight against. And no woman's going to be a perfect mother. That doesn't really exist. But everyone's, every mother's going to know how to take care of her own children if she gives, gives herself the chance to do that. As we've alluded to that these sidewalk counsellors, helpers, uh, there's now laws against them. They began in Tasmania and then I think Victoria was the next state uh, to erect exclusion zones around uh, abortion uh, clinics. Uh, now, you and a, a Tasmanian pro-life advocate, uh, Graham Preston, uh, decided to, to challenge uh, these laws. You decided to defy these laws. You were fined and convicted and decided to challenge them on constitutional grounds because Australia has, in it, we don't have free speech, but we have an implied right to political uh, communication. Uh, now, obviously, the, we're, we've seen these laws spread since, and so there's the, the winds of, of government were, were, up, were upon, you know, making sure that these laws stuck. Why did you, uh, did you decide to, well, first defy these, defy these laws? Well, the simple answer is we just had to, I had to, because, because of the two aspects, 
um, because of the pro-life aspect, but also because of the freedom aspect. At the, at the time, I was more interested in the, the pro-life aspect. Um, on my old website, almost everything on this, there are articles of pro-life articles. But when, once I started to learn about freedom of political communication, I didn't know that we didn't have freedom of speech a few years ago until these laws came in. So that got me interested in a whole lot of other threats to our freedoms. And I realized that we're, Australian citizens are pretty precarious. And I thought, if I've got the opportunity to go to the high court, maybe we can get some more um, clarity about what freedom of political communication really, really means. What are the parameters of this implied freedom? Um, unfortunately, we found out that we don't have the freedom to, to express our views in certain places, which is quite a scary thought for me. And I was, I said this at the time, um, when, when, we, when the decision was handed down, journalists who were reporting about the case, they should be worried. You know, people who disagree with me and, and people like me should be really worried because who's next? Where else are we going to find that we can't express ourselves just quietly, peacefully give our point of view? Where else is that going to happen? How are these laws going to be expanded in the future? They're the questions that we should be asking ourselves. And you're assisted by the, the Human Rights Law Alliance, which is a project of the Australian Christian Lobby, which was founded by their now uh, National Director, Martin Isles. So, as certainly a lot of people recognise the the significance you know, of cha challenging these laws and you know, gave it that gave you the the best legal uh, defence uh, possible, but they decided that it wasn't political speech. What uh, uh, your pro life views? It was it was to do with medicine. Graham's was determined to be definitely political communication, since his, he was holding a sign. Um, that mentioned uh, a quote from the UN uh, Declaration on the Rights of the Child. Every child has the right to life. I think it's Section 8. So that's a document that Australia is a signatory to. And there are many other documents Australia signed. I think there are seven that all talk about the right to life. So Australia is, the Australian government is contradicting its own stance by criminalising people who just want to stick up for what the government has said that they will stick up for. Um, so anyway, the judges said in Graham's case, um, there is a burden on freedom of political communication, but that burden is slight and he can make his communication elsewhere outside the zone. Um, but yes, you're right, mine was deemed not to be political communication. Um, that's the judge's decision. I'm going to be appealing my conviction in the, in the Supreme Court next year. Um, not on constitutional grounds, obviously, but just my personal conviction. It would seem to, to most people that if you want to, uh, because pro-life advocates, they it's yes, they they want to uh, save the the life of the child, but there there's also the other aspect they want to change the law to protect the the unborn, hence the the political communication. Yeah. Uh, so it would seem yeah. common sense that yeah that that sort of speech should be protected. But the, the High Court also said that in public areas, the, the governments are allowed to create free speech zones. So they, can, they pretty much got the green light to sort of, they could say, well, anywhere, like you're not allowed to have this speech or any of that speech because the High Court has said, uh, oh, well, as long as there's some public place where, where you have free speech, then that's enough. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think it's it's part of human nature to want to be where the action is, so to speak. Um, not that abortion is an action, you know, that you want to observe. But in the sense that if, if there's a funeral, we want to go to the funeral. If there's a wedding, we want to go to the wedding or someone's birthday or um, if there's a memorial service or something big's happening, we want to be there. It's part of human nature to be on, on site. Um, we're unique in the sense that our kind of witness has multiple purposes as well. Changing the law is really important to us. Many politicians, especially during the debate um, on the, the uh, exclusion zones in Victoria, said that it's settled law. The abortion abortion's legal, it's settled law. There's not to be any more um, 
dialogue about it. But that's so so wrong. It's just wrong on so many levels. Of course, we're not happy with the law. Of course, we do want it to change. And our witness testifies to that, testifies to what's happening inside that place that's just across the road or just just outside where we are. Lots, so many people walk past the abortion mills. They don't even know what happens there. They don't know it's about abortion. They see fertility control clinic or some euphemism. They don't know what it means. We're there to tell them what it means. Then obviously we are there for the women. That's one aspect of what we do as well. The, the one that people um, probably identify with the most. And then for some people, this is irrelevant for us. The prayer aspect or the spiritual aspect is also very important. Now, as uh, we mentioned, this law has uh, spread to, to other states. Uh, the only states that don't have exclusion zones are South Australia and Western Australia, but there's already bills in, in the works to uh, have uh, those laws passed there, which would see basically the whole, whole of Australia have exclusion zones around uh, abortion clinics. And there's also pressure on the, the federal government to, to make sure that abortions can be accessed at public hospitals, and then we had the, the Labor Party uh, going to the election proposing uh, fully taxpayer-funded uh, abortions. And it seems to be that there's this pro-abortion consensus in Australian politics. There are some good pro-life uh, advocates, both in the, the coalition and the, the Labor Party, but they, they don't have much sway. So what can be done because it seems where we're in a very very dark place where at the pro-abortion advocates they seem they seem to have basically captured it, all of our institutions and pretty much got their way yeah you're right tim um well it can be a bit discouraging but um i think we just have to take the long view uh there's always something we can do and politicians are only going to change their minds unless they're completely ideologically set on abortion, which which most of them aren't. Some of them, you know, we know about Emily's list and we know about the really rabid ones. But there are many of them, I, I would guess perhaps the men, who think that we really need abortion, women need it. Um, you can't go back to backyard, you know, which is another bit of a um, myth about the number of backyard abortions. But... Um, there's a big group of them that eventually will change their mind if they know the public has will not support abortion anymore. I think the challenge for us, I think at the moment our political options are very limited. I think that exclusion zones will come in in the other states, I'm, I'm afraid to say. I think that's realistic to say that. But what we can do is, is influence the people that we know. And I think this is so important because pro-life is there's this narrative that that is out there that pro-life is a mean and um that they're you know they want to discriminate against women they don't care about women they're judgmental they're bigoted all that stuff what we need to do is to talk to everyone that's in our sphere our families our neighbors our friends and make sure they know that if they're pregnant or their daughter's pregnant or their sister or their wife or whatever if she's got an unplanned pregnancy, she can come to us and we will help. We'll get her the help. We personally will. So that's you, everyone who's listening to your show who's pro-life. Make sure every woman around you knows that you're you're kind, you know, that you that they can go to you, that you will support her in, and you will find her help if she is facing an unplanned pregnancy. Find a way to communicate the effect that an abortion will have on these women. They really need to know that because the abortion industry is not telling women how much they're going to suffer afterwards. So that's a really good place that each of us can start just on the one on one level. And in time, in time, it will change. I know it will change. But um, we have to be creative. We have to get on social media. And you know, God knows that the Twitter sphere is full of pro bots. We just have to get on there, dedicate a little bit of time every day to getting on there and trying to share some stories, dispel some myths, try to comment in a constructive way that's not not hate speech, like actual hate speech. I don't mean made up hate speech. I do see some bad comments from pro-lifers sometimes and it's shameful. They should not be saying they wish someone is, was aborted, you know. That's the kind of thing we shouldn't be saying. It's not constructive. 
that's just a couple of places we can start. There's, there are some good groups around um, that are trying to reach out to young people, especially going into schools. I think that's important before the kids are sexually active, they should know what abortion is. And unfortunately, that date, that time period or um, age limit, I should say, is, is decreasing all the time um, for other reasons like pornography and so on. When the culture changes, the law will change. It won't be the other way around in Australia, at least not for a couple of generations. Yeah, we definitely need to get back to, to basics and uh, be more community minded because governments and politicians only follow uh, the culture. And uh, there is obviously, you, know, you, talk, you talked about social media there. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with social media censorship. Uh, uh, there has been censorship of uh, pro-life uh, views and, and images that, that we discussed. And yeah, I do agree. Uh, some pro-life advocates can get carried away because it's a very emotional issue and you've got to make sure that you've got to keep your emotions uh, in check. But certainly the, the internet, even though it has its, its disadvantages, it's still a powerful tool. And probably the reason why there's a lot of young pro-life is because they can find out information themselves online. They can research things for themselves. They're not just getting uh, the, the health lessons at, at their high school. They, they can actually find out uh, for, for themselves and make up their own mind. And that's why Gen Z, for example, there's a conservative resurgence. Obviously, that's uh, abortion is not an exclusively conservative issue, but it's, it's code for a lot of cultural issues. Yeah, that's a great point about people being able to do their own research. And I think um, when we see what some of the big groups in the US, like Live Action, have done, they've got so many great informative YouTube videos that just keep getting shared around the place. And eventually, that's the kind of thing that's going to seep into our culture. People are going to realize this isn't a religious uh, argument. This isn't a, um, an anti-woman or a patriarchal argument. This is a human rights argument. These are babies and they, have, they deserve the right to life and it's up to life to protect them. The U.S. is the, the beacon of hope, obviously, with uh, the laws in, in Georgia and Alabama to protect the unborn. And uh, I should just make the point that these laws, they're, they're not about punishing the, the woman who has an abortion. It's outlawing the procedure of the abortion. So it's the, the doctor uh, performing it. Uh, now, obviously, America has had Roe versus Wade for 46 years, but there is, there is definitely mood to protect the unborn over there but as we've we're seeing in Australia at the moment there's uh, there's form of uh, what I call uh, corporate blackmail with Disney and Netflix threatening to boycott uh, Georgia because of these uh, abortion laws so it's it's still a, a tough battle it is um, it remains to be seen if those companies will actually go ahead because they get big tax breaks in the Republican states, because Republicans are traditionally more concerned about building up the economy. So they, um, well, they'll have to put their money where, the, where their mouth is. Um, they may not move. Another, another thing about the states is it just seems to be becoming very polarized. So you're getting, um, whereas you, abortion used to be available um, across the whole country, basically, now you've got it res really restricted in some of the states and then open slather to nine months in, in, in other states. So I guess um, the governments are becoming, the state governments are becoming more polarized as well. Um, so it's an interesting scenario, quite different from Australia. Really, there's no comparison with what's happening in Australia. But as you say, they, it does give us hope because the pro-life movement um, compared to Australia certainly is, is very active in the US. They've got numbers, they're very creative with the way they get through to people. They got their campaigns and they just go for it. And um, it's, it helps everyone, it helps every pro-lifer in the world these days because of the internet. And as you mentioned, it's, it's very polarized. Have, obviously there's been some horrid laws that have been passed in places like New York, but those, uh, US states which have passed uh, restrictions, it shows that 
reversing the, the, the pro-abortion trend is, is possible, but it's not just simply passing a law and then it's, it's ended. Like in, in these states, it's been a process over the past 10, 20 years where actually abortion clinics have closed because there is no more demand for them. Yeah, that's part of the, part of the uh, scenario as well. Um, there's a few different things coming into play. Um, just on the topic of abortion clinics closing though, something that we need to keep in mind is that there's a trend toward using the abortion pill. So we need to just uh, have that in the back of our minds. If an abortion mill closes, it doesn't mean that there are going to be fewer abortions necessarily. And the abortion pill is available online. It's available by phone in many places, including Australia. Um, so that's just something that we need to factor in number-wise. Um, uh, that it's it's a horrible trend. It's awful. It's it's basically um, backyard abortion in your own home. I mean, on demand. It's it's just a, a revolting thing. But yeah, you're really. It's right that some mills are closing due to lack of demand, and that's happened in Australia as well. Well, that's what the the debate was over Tasmania. Their abortion clinic closed down, and that of uh, Labor was lobbying for well, the, we need government intervention to make sure that it stays in in business. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The uh, Liberal government was very weak on abortion. Um, they they give some kind of travel allowance to women who want to go to the mainland. There was an abortion pill center opened up down there, but that closed as well. Um, so I'm not quite sure what the story was about that. I think they're still waiting on the state government to come up with something. But it brings up another point, which is that not every doctor wants to perform abortions. It's not a very popular a modality among doctors. They would much prefer to be saving lives than killing babies. So it's pretty hard to get staff, which is why these regional ones have closed. I'm putting Hobart in the regional category. Hope that's okay, Hobart. But yeah, they certainly do have trouble finding staff. And it was the case when the late-term abortion went ahead in Tasmania as well. They, staff didn't want to do it. Hospital staff didn't want to do it. And the private, privately owned abortion mill staff did not want to do late-term abortions. And that's often overlooked, the, the view of the actual medical practitioners. For example, with the, the euthanasia law that passed in, in Victoria, the medical community was opposed because they uh, take their, their Hippocratic Oath you know, very seriously, do no harm. They, they're there to save lives, make sure that people continue to live like healthy, productive lives. And this is just totally against what what they believe that they're meant to do. Yeah, you're right, Tim. It's It must be traumatic for a doctor to be involved in intentionally taking a life. And I read about um, some of the experiences of cleaning staff in Canada, where, where euthanasia has been legal there for a while. The, the cleaning staff didn't want to have to go into a room where someone had just killed themselves. And it's the same with the support staff in hospitals too. They, it's not only the the doctor who's directly performing the procedure, whether it be abortion or um, euthanasia, but everyone around them. Imagine even if you're working on the switchboard, you take a call and you have to make a booking for assisted dying or, you know, or whatever. If, if you're in a hospital, you're there to help. You've got this great job, you're helping people, and then you also, also have to help kill people. It's just absurd. Now, before we finish, uh, what, uh, as we mentioned, you, you homeschool uh, your uh, children, which is, it's considered quite old fashioned, but it's actually becoming more and more popular as, as uh, a lot of people are finding what's being taught in, in schools. It's, it's both, they're, they're finding that their children aren't being properly educated and they're getting all of this in, indoctrination. Can, so can you describe what that experience is like I did put my kids in school for a couple of years when I moved to Melbourne and um, I really hated it. So I have tried school and it was found wanting. I, I just enjoy homeschooling. It's, we have a very relaxed approach. Um, we get to delve into things that we're really interested in and my kids are very much aware of politics and what's going on in the world around them. And you know, I, they learn at their own pace. They don't have to do a grade five book because they're in grade five. They can do a grade, book or a grade six level book, you know? 
And if, if they're having trouble with their fractions, we can slow down and we can spend more time on their fractions. And if they're good at their times tables, they can whiz through their times tables. So we love history, we use a lot of literature, and um, I guess it's a very relaxed, uh, liberal, in the best sense of the word, liberal education. It's, uh, we use the Western canon for our literature basis for the older ones, so they're getting a great um, liberal arts education in the home, in our PJs, if we want <laughs> yeah. to. Yeah, uh, that would always be fun. And the, the way that I see it, if, like, it shouldn't be that, you know, you should read Animal Farm because it's subscribed to you in, like, year 11. Like, if you, like, hear about that book and want to read it, like, yeah, read it and, like, let's discuss it. Like, it, it, sh it should be, like, that's how learning should be. Like, you actively seek it out. It is good to be challenged sometimes and read something that you don't feel like reading uh, or something that's not what you would normally read. But, yeah, I agree. It should be that you want to want to read it, want to find out why why people quote this book, what's interesting about this book. And, you know, I, when my kids were in school, I saw some of the stuff they were reading. It was, I didn't like it. And I've heard of really, really inappropriate books being given to especially high school students too. It's not good literature and there's no moral. It's, it's basically a, a form of indoctrination. So we want to avoid that. I look back on my schooling now and there's there's so many books, uh, classics of uh, Western literature that I uh, never read and I'm like slowly catching up uh, up up to it. There's there's so much culture that uh, children aren't getting at school now. That's so true. They, they're not being taught history and um, uh, uh, most of it's because of the anti-Christian slant in, in our society. Modern Australia, I guess the West in general, is trying to extract the great significance of Christianity and the way Christianity molded what what is good that's what is left that's good in our society today. So if you have want to take Christianity out of out of Western culture and and by extension out of the education system, you have to get rid of the beautiful music, the beautiful art, the beautiful architecture, the wonderful literature. Uh, virtue, uh, the pursuit of virtue, and it has to be replaced by ugliness, awful music, um, programs like safe schools, because that's all that is is left if you take Christianity out of our culture. So it's a, it, I really feel for kids that are in school these days. They're not being taught the basics. They're not being taught. They're taught, being taught how to quickly read, not how to decode. Just how to quickly sight read some words they're not being taught to form sentences they're not being taught to think things through and that's exactly what the government wants consumers who are basically ignorant who just want to put all their effort into work and don't ever have, have to question what's going on around them and so the education system's done a great job of that i think yeah they definitely have and also uh, replacing the the role of, of parents as well there's there, there's so many uh, as we were talking about before, parents who just give their children over to the schools and say, educate my, my child, I, I trust you. Oh yeah, parents have got to be much more discerning. They've got to find out what their kids are being taught in school. It's You just cannot t trust the teachers. I Even my kids were in school for I think two years out of 20 or whatever. And it, there were some things I didn't know until after I'd taken them out. And I was keeping a pretty close eye on the school, this Catholic school, and I found out that they were doing some meditation, some Buddhist meditation. So if I'd known that, I would have taken them out earlier. Um, but yeah, don't trust the schools. Don't trust the schools. Go, go to the teacher, have a relationship with the teacher, have a relationship with the principal, find out what's going on there. Because sometimes, even the principal doesn't know that there's safe schools type stuff being taught in one of his own classrooms. And I heard of a case in uh, Perth where the teacher didn't know what was scheduled. She just, there's some kind of um, online service where she told this company um, what she wanted taught that year and the company made up the books, some kind of custom deal where they, they put their own uh, resources into these books and sent it to the teacher. And she hadn't looked through it and there was trash in it, safe school stuff, links to the same links that were at one point shut down here, the um, minus 18 
you know, you would have heard about that in relation yeah. to safe schools. Yeah. So all that same stuff was there. Even the teacher didn't know what was going to be taught in that class. If she'd opened the book, she would have seen. But um, this is this is what's happening. So if the teachers and the principals don't know, then yeah, the parents have to be doing their job. That sounds uh, incredible, but uh, I've followed this stuff closely. It's it's not exactly that surprising to me. Well, it's been great to, to hear your story today, uh, Kathy, and I'm glad that uh, our audience did as well. You should serve as an inspiration to, to, to many people about what can be achieved in, in life and, and how you can persevere through uh, adversity. And I certainly hope that you, you keep up with your, your activism and, and also uh, just be, being a great mother as well. Well, thanks, Tim. It's been lovely talking to you too, and I really admire everything that you've done through your site, and, and um, yeah, you keep up the good work too. And that's the show for today. If you want to hear more about Kathy's activism and work, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, she has two online blogs, lightupthedarkness.net and thefreedomsproject.com. It's exciting times here at The Unshackled with my colleague Steel Archer launching his Detonation program, which is broadcast live on The Unshackled YouTube channel as well as in podcast form, so make sure you check it out. Our joint production with The XYZ and The Rational Rise, The Uncuckables, which is live every Thursday at 8.30pm Melbourne time, continues to grow in popularity. Make sure you subscribe to the dedicated Uncuckables YouTube channel so you're notified when we go live. As the Project Veritas expose have revealed, uh, big tech is determined to hide and censor right of centre views online. That's why we have diversified our online presence on free speech social media. We're on gab.ai slash the unshackled. We're also at minds.com slash the underscore unshackled. We are also on mewe.com slash p slash the unshackled. And we have our growing Telegram channel on the encrypted messaging service at t.me slash the unshackled. We also have multiple ways for you to support the work of The Unshackled financially. We are on patreon.com slash the unshackled and paypal.me slash the unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash membership and our web donation form at theunshackled.net slash donate. We are also now on subscribestar.com slash the unshackled. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.